In the province of British Columbia, there were actually more Chinese than people of European ancestry in you know, the 1800s and also in the early 1900s. Most were actually from California after they finished the gold rush. 1860s, a large wave of Chinese miners came headed northwards, not just from the U.S., but also from China. Literally, North America to the Chinese was called Gold Mountain. Gold Mountain would make, be translated as a land of opportunity where you can um, find a job and, and, uh, and, and prosper. In 1858, right the same year that British Columbia became a crown colony, there was a large gold deposit on the Fraser River that was announced and uh, a number of upwards of 30,000 miners actually came up from California to what was then called New Caledonia, then quickly became the colony of British Columbia. And so ultimately they found their way up the Fraser River to the Quesnel River, and then they followed the Quesnel River to the Caribou River and to the headwaters of the Caribou River, a mountain that's now called Yanks Peak. Many of them came from California because the gold rush there had petered out. Later on, some of them came from China directly, from Canton or Guangzhou. People are struggling because it's uh, toward the end of the uh, dying days of the Qing dynasty. There's lots of war and civil war and strife in China in the 19th century. And some of the areas that they're leaving are, you know, there's starvation. A lot of uh, internal strife of uh, warlords and bandits. Those were the dark days of uh, the end of a dynasty. And my ancestors, like everyone else, um, sought better ways to, um, to raise their family. I think they came here because they had heard stories about this, the opportunities that existed here. It was a land uh, where the streets were paved with gold, basically. And um, the, the mountains were full of gold. But why they're leaving there is because of these networks, these kinds of uh, pathways that have been grooved for them and these desires and dreams that come to them from Gold Mountain and sort of whisper, you know, if you follow this path the other way, you'll be rich too, just like your uncle or just like this other guy. They were some of the best taught miners there were. I do believe in China, they actually studied on how to mine for gold. Their ancestors mined for gold. They knew how the old ancient channels ran through the country from the glacier movement and everything, and that's the ones that they chased. As soon as the white miner, as soon as they get the nuggets, then they left the place. So the Chinese went to the same place and then they sieved through all the settlements to get every flakes of gold. That also gave the white miner an excuse to saying that the Chinese people jumped their claims and which is not true because they have already left. So that shows a kind of discrimination and prejudice that how they arise. It's mainly competitions for wealth and com competitions for, uh, you know, and we see who get more gold, uh, you know, to get rich. So the Chinese miner carry their belongings in a very conventional Chinese way with a pole about five feet long, and then at both ends, one end, they put their belongings, and the other end, they put the apparatus for gold mining. Usually, it's a gold pen, but some of them also brought in a rocker. A rocker is a kind of apparatus of two stacks of boxes. They scoop up a settlement, and then on the top of the first locker, and then they shake and then the final sentiment go down to the bottom layer. And then the bottom layer, they usually line it with a piece of either gunny sacks or a piece of rough cloth. In that way, they catch every speck of gold flakes. And then, how do they get the gold flake out? Very ingenious. They burn the cloth, and then all the gold melted, and so they got the nugget. What they did is that they'd wash the, uh, the rocks that might contain the gold in the dirt itself, and then they would pile their stones in piles like walls. If they just tossed the rocks at everybody, they said, well, did we mine this or not? And so they knew that this area was done, and then they would move on to the next area and pile another row of rocks and another row of rocks. And then later on, they used what they call the hydraulic press. 
In other words, they deliver a jet of water from a stream or from a river and then into a hose. And then the hose target the bank of the land and then the soil run down. And then that's how they catch the gold. If you want to put it into today's prices, they say it's about $115 million came off of the Cherry Creek gold that was all through here for about five miles of this creek. But one of the things that I have found over the years prospecting and meaning a lot of gold miners is not all gold was declared. So a lot of the Chinese men who came, and it was mostly men, of course, they had the same dreams that everybody else did of just striking it rich on their own. The realities of living in a gold rush town, however, do very quickly catch up with you. A lot of people of, of all ethnicities, but specifically the Chinese community here in Barkerville, realized that there was more money to be made uh, being part of the merchant class. And so very quickly, uh, networks of people throughout the colony would be able to provide goods and services uh, to a remote town like Barkerville. And people would be willing to pay a premium for those things, whether that be groceries or you know clothing, mining equipment. So what they got really good at was what I would call as a scholar a kind of economics of relative location, which is you got a, a bunch of different places and you look around and go, you know, it's funny, this thing here, you know, bananas, there's like bananas everywhere and they're really cheap, but if I just move them over there, I can sell them for a lot more. Like for instance, a barrel of flour costs $60, but in Victoria, okay, it's only sold for $12. They had to find a way to survive. The only jobs that really were available to them were as, as cooks, as uh, houseboys. Some of them opened up their own businesses. It's not like people in China as kids going, oh, someday I'm going to grow up to be a laundryman. I want to wash other people's dirty clothes. That's my dream. That's not the dream. The dream is that if you go to a place with lots and lots of men, 95 to 99 percent men, and a lot of those people refuse to wash clothes because they think of it as women's work and beneath them or below them, well, then you can charge them like a dollar for a shirt. Now, when the Chinese make money in this land, it means a lot. If they make a dollar in Canada, it's equal to $60. And then later on, it was even more. It's about $100. And then they send the money home to China to feed their family and to offer comforts for the families. One of the main clashes between the European and Chinese communities had little to do with race and more to do with business practices because the Caucasian population felt that the Chinese population didn't spend enough money in their side of town, whereas Caucasians were constantly going to Chinatown for a variety of goods and services. So they felt that it was a little weighted not on their side, I suppose. And of course, um, at that time, the easiest way to get um, cheap labor was to tap into the, the Chinese community. There was uh, you know, a lot of prejudice about the Chinese coming, a lot of misinformation about them taking the jobs or having the jobs or shouldn't have the jobs. Chinese became scapegoats because they would accept wages that were less than white workers. But I think it really boils down to the fact that many Canadians did not feel that the Chinese could ever assimilate. They were just too different. They're different because they're not Christian and they have dark skin. So therefore, they don't deserve anything that you deserve just for being white. The Okanagan Steam Laundry ran a, a whole page ad in 1913, basically attacking the Chinese businesses. So the stereotypes start to, uh, to arise. Uh, the rat infested opium den. There's a Chinese man smoking opium in the corner. The worker is literally spitting on the clothes. You know, the language was like, you know, would you rather help uh, a Chinaman, you know, make money out of our country and send it across the Pacific or help uh, a nice white girl, you know, make a decent living? The story that my great-grandfather was told is that when you're washing the floor in the family home, if there's a, a nickel on the floor, do not pick it up and move it. Leave it where it is, wash around it, so you don't get accused of, of stealing. So in 1917, um, to discourage any interbreeding, uh, there was a law passed in BC that prohibited Chinese men from hiring white women. Um, and it wasn't long before, of course, there were, there were calls for complete exclusion, and that happened six years later in 1923. 
If you look at the numbers of people who actually migrated to uh, North America, at least three quarters of them, we don't know ever came of these people. They don't have descendants because they didn't find a mate. I'm walking around Chinatown as a, as a young boy, um, these old men would walk up to me and the whole Chinatown, Vancouver's Chinatown, were all bachelor men. Everyone, almost, there were no women and they would just come and, and touch me and, and pull my cheeks and pat me on the head because they don't see children. They left no descendants. So in the history of gold rush towns like Barkerville, um, nearby Stanley on Lightning Creek, you do see a pattern of the Chinese community staying in the area much longer than the Caucasian community. Some people never really got out of being a laborer, you know, someone who built roads or railroads. But a lot of those people, what they were aspiring to or dreaming of was working, paying off the debt, saving up enough money, getting married, buying some land, save enough money so that you could get a small business, whether it was a laundry or a restaurant. It's a classic underdog story. You know, how much can this community take? Uh, how much discrimination? The humble beginnings and through, you know, sheer force of determination, never losing hope, gradually through the decades, finally being recognized as equals. When we hear the term gold mountain, and we associate it with gold itself, but if you think about gold as wealth and opportunity, then there's all these opportunities that could be really created out of nothing. They make money through their trades, through their hard work, through providing service. So they will go in that sense, but not necessarily that you really find the metal. Generation after generation of Cantonese speaking, you know, men, um, who, well, basically built communities. And the long-term legacy, even to today, is that these places that they went, well, later, when Hong Kong Chinese started to come to Canada in the 1980s and 90s, they followed the past of those earlier Gold Mountain, you know, migrants. And even if those people in the 1990s didn't realize they were following the footsteps of someone 150 years before, they actually were. <laughs>